Good morning. Good morning. I hope all of you had a very restful night last night and uh, ready to worship this morning. Mr. Steve, would you lead us in prayer, sir? Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning with thankful hearts. Thankful, Lord, that we can once again gather in your house to worship you. We pray, Father, that you may be very real to us this morning, that you may visit each heart. And I pray, Lord, for the man of the hour this morning as you prepare his heart. I pray, Lord, that you may lay the message on his heart that is most needed to be heard this morning. And for those that serve each Sunday, we pray, Father, that you might bless them in a special way. Father, there are many this morning we know that need your healing touch. And, Father, we know there are those that are lost, Father. We pray that you might save them. And there may be a heart, Lord, this morning that has grown cold. We pray that you would visit them, that you may refresh that heart this morning as well. And all these many things we pray and ask this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Stop, but I know. 
announcements. No choir practice today. They're all at a women's retreat except for about three people. So try to get that started back next week. A Wednesday night. I told uh, Brian that I was going to tell people, you know, Gary's still trying to recuperate. I was going to tell them that Gary called service off Wednesday night to celebrate Cinco de Mayo. He is, he is still uh, under the weather and goes back Friday to see the doctor and hopes to be back. If you have not brought your contribution for the Baptist Children's Home, uh, it, it, it is running through April, but we still have uh, we still have it. We haven't carried it to them yet. So you know, if you want to drop it by, or, or, uh, any other announcements? If not, let's stand as we sing. I love you, Lord. coming and it's going to have our morning prayer but prayer request um, hopefully you got the one call from this morning uh, Jan Kinley's uh, sister was in an accident and is in ICU uh, remember our church remember our country remember the people that, that have been on our heart other ones this morning Oh, yesterday, yes, Bill. The whole team coming in. Just a Let us pray. Lord, we do want to thank you for allowing us to come together in your house of worship. Lord, we just pray that you're with this service and that you're with each and every person that's listening, uh, whether they're here or online. We just pray for your will to be done in their lives and in their hearts. Help the prayers that were just mentioned, Lord, and any other may be laying on our hearts that were unspoken. 
Guide us, direct us, and bless us, for it is in Jesus' name that we pray. And sing a medley, but before we do, I want to go ahead and introduce uh, Mark so that as soon as we sing, he can come and start. I told him that I was going to tell you that he was an old friend, and I knew that because he's retired and I'm not. <laughs> His uh, retired pastor from First Baptist, uh, welcome. Uh, on Mark for, I don't know, when we served together on key leadership was, what, 40 years ago or so? So, uh, known him a while. Uh, we are blessed to have he and his wife today and Mark to Somehow, you'll sunshine on. 
Well, good morning, everyone. How are you today? Uh, I feel like I've, I've come back home. Uh, I was born and raised in Thomasville. Uh, graduated from Thomasville High School almost 50 years ago. So, yes, I am old enough to retire. <laughs> uh, coming here today brought back a lot of memories. You may not know this, but 50 years ago, Tower Road was a drag strip. And I was a teenager back then, and one of my joys was getting in my mother's car and coming over here and going down what, Fuller Mill Road? And get on Tower Road and let it fly. And we'd go, I mean, back then hardly nobody lived on this road. I mean, it was just very few houses. This church was not here. Bethany Baptist Church was not there. I mean, there was hardly nothing. So us teenage boys, that was one of our thrills. Now, I didn't drag strip with somebody else. I wasn't quite that stupid. But I would get in, my, get in my mother's car, and I would let that thing go. And I would get up to about 90 miles an hour going down this road. Before you hit the big curve, we had enough sense not to go that far. And I also remember a couple of my cousins, who were also named Blair, they lived over here on Fuller Mill Road, those residential areas. And when it snowed, that was the perfect place to go sledding and i remember a lot of us kids in the blair family would come up here and one of my cousins would open up his house he was older than me and we'd have a marshmallow roast and we'd all go out and slide down the road in our sleds and i just have a lot of good memories about this area right in here i grew up on what's called east holly hill road Went to Liberty Drive Elementary School, the old junior high school. It's no longer there. And then to the high school and graduated, like I said, almost 50 years ago. Also remember where this church used to be located, over on Fairgrove Road, that area. I don't know if a lot of you, I don't know how long this church has been here. But this was back in the 70s. I had a dear friend of mine, same age I was, we were in school together, and he went to Oak Hill Memorial Baptist Church there. I grew up Methodist. When I was a kid, I was going to Fairgrove Methodist Church. And, but he would invite me to go to Oak Hill from time to time, especially for revivals. And I remember that so well, going to Oak Hill. I switched over to Baptist in 1976, and I've been a diehard Baptist ever since. Southern Baptist, been in pastors uh, for most of that time. I pastored Smith Grove Baptist Church over in Churchland, West Davison area for many years. And during that time, where I was dating my wife when I went there, and we got married a year after. And then we got the, we got the opportunity to go up close to the mountains. My wife's from Boone. And uh, she likes all that mountain area. So uh, we, we were closer to the mountains in, in Caldwell County. And I was there at a church for about six and a half years. And I was at a state convention meeting in 1998. And here comes Leonard Rollins. Anybody remember Leonard? He was director of missions in this association for many, many years. He died, I think, about 20 years ago. But anyway, he came up to me and wanted to know if I would be interested in a church back here in Davidson County that had just opened up. The pastor had left. And I, asked, I said, well, I hadn't really thought about moving from the church I was currently pastoring. But he was telling me that uh, First Baptist Church of Welcome was open. And he thought I might be a good candidate. So I prayed about it. I called up Leonard and said I would be interested in pursuing that. And sure enough, one thing led to another, and I was called as their pastor. And little did I know when I went there, I would end up being there longer than any pastor they'd ever had. I was there for over 20 years. I retired on my 65th birthday, 
and we did an awful lot that last year I was there to get everything ready. It was a very congenial relationship. I had an associate pastor that had been under me for many years. I could tell he was chewing at the bit. He wanted to be the next pastor. And God worked everything out, and he is the pastor there now, and they're doing wonderful, even though they've had to go through the pandemic. And I just have great hopes for that church under his leadership. But it was a wonderful experience. But it's good to be back in Davison County. Uh, I've been here, like I said, all these years since I went back from Caldwell County. We live actually up close to where your pastor lives. He's up in Midway. I live over in Arcadia. And uh, I've known Gary for a long, long time. In fact, he came out of First Baptist Church Welcome, where I pastored all these many years. So there's a lot I could say about these reminiscences about coming back here to Thomasville and so forth. But anyway, I want us to get into the Word of God. If you have your Bibles, we're going to look at the last chapter of the Gospel of John. John 21, verses 15 through 19. John 21, verses 15 through 19. Here is the familiar story of Jesus before he ascends back to the Father. He's with some of the disciples up there along the Sea of Galilee, and he has this very interesting conversation with Peter. So let's pick it up at verse 15, and we'll go through verse 19. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. We ask God's blessings upon this reading of his holy word. Notice the title of the message today is a question. And you can obviously guess where I got that from. The question is, do you love Jesus? Now we know what's going on here in this text with Jesus and Peter. Peter is one of my most favorite figures or characters in all the Bible. One of the reasons is because he's so human. <laughs> we can relate to Peter. Peter is a man with great courage. He has great leadership potential, but he also has flaws, like all of us. He has weaknesses. One of them is he tends to speak before he thinks. He puts his foot in his mouth from time to time. You know the examples throughout scripture bring or the gospels bring these out uh, Peter was one of the first to ever s always speak up when Jesus was asking questions you remember when he was with the disciples our Lord at Caesarea Philippi and he asked the disciples who do people say that I am and they gave him all kind of responses but then Jesus looked at the disciples but who do you say that I am. And who's the first one to say anything? Peter. Because he's the one that tends to speak out first. He says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. 
Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. Yes, Peter was right on target there. But then there was another occasion where you have Jesus telling the disciples that he's going to go to Jerusalem, he's going to be turned over to sinners, he's going to suffer, and he's going to die. Peter is very upset with Jesus' words. He takes Jesus over to the side, away from the other disciples, and he says, Lord, this is not so. This is not going to happen to you. Because Peter couldn't understand how this fit into God's scheme of things. Why would Jesus die? He's the Messiah. He's the king. He's supposed to reign in glory. He's supposed to set up his kingdom. Why would he die? They had no understanding of Jesus' real mission. Why did Jesus come to this earth? You hear all kinds of things today. But we all know the answer. Jesus came to earth to die. That was his primary mission. And Peter was saying exactly what the devil would have wanted him to say to not go to the cross don't die just live your life and teach us and 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 do all these good things heal people we love all that but this thought of you dying that we don't like that so don't talk about that anymore and jesus says get to peter he says get behind me satan because peter was saying what the devil would have said because the devil did not want Jesus to go to the cross and die for the sins of the world. He tried everything he could to get Jesus out of the way before the cross. He tried to get Jesus stoned to death. He tried to kill Jesus when he was a baby by Herod the Great. He tried so many ways to get rid of Jesus before the cross because the cross would seal Satan's doom. Of course, that was proven three days later when he rose from the dead. Then we go to the night where Jesus is with the disciples. They're celebrating Passover there in Jerusalem. The Last Supper, as we often call it. Jesus drops another bombshell. One of you will betray me can't believe what they've heard. They start asking themselves, who is it? They look to Jesus. Can you tell us who it is? And of course, he says, the one who's dipping with me in the bowl. Jesus then says, tonight is going to be fulfilled the prophecy shepherd is taken the shepherd is smitten is stricken the sheep will be scattered all of you will abandon me this night he says Peter again is upset this can't happen so what does he do Peter puts his foot in his mouth says the first thing that comes to his mind he says Lord I don't care about these others if they abandon you but I will never never leave you I will even die for you if necessary. And we all know what happened that very night, hours later. Jesus is arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's taken to the court of Caiaphas, one of the Jewish leaders. Peter is following from a distance after the scene where he takes out his little sword and cuts off the guy's ear. <laughs> He's following from a distance after they had all ran away. Peter wants to know what's going to happen. And so Jesus is going through his trials. And while that's happening, Peter is warming himself with a fire going on. It was a cold night. And we know what happens by reading the Gospels. Three different times, Peter is challenged 
Are you one of those who knows Jesus? Aren't you one of those? Your speech gives you away. You talk like a Galilean. Surely you are with Jesus. Three times, Peter says, I don't know the man. I don't know who you're talking about. After he had just said hours before, he would never, never leave Jesus. He would even die for him three times. He says, no, I don't know who you're talking about. He even starts using profanity. He's cursing, trying to convince these people. That's one of the reasons I can't stand profanity. I never use profanity. I can't stand it. I was brought up that way. And I've never understood why people feel like they have to curse to get a point across. That's what Peter's doing. I have just the opposite. Somebody has to curse to convince me they're telling the truth. I've lost all respect for them. Because that, doesn't, doesn't, that, that hurts your cause. It doesn't help you. If you start swearing and bringing down oaths, but that's what Peter does. That's just, that just shows you how desperate he is in this situation. This is obviously a, a terrible flaw in Peter's character. And many would have thought, this is it for Peter. He's, he's done. And I'm sure he thought that himself. He thought he had ruined it any chance he had of serving Jesus. So this leads us here, after the death, after the resurrection, here we see Jesus with some of the disciples. They, they're out there fishing, and they see Jesus on the shoreline, and he's preparing breakfast for them. It's early in the morning. They've been out all night, coming in, they, they have breakfast together in verse 15. And then notice how Jesus ministers to Simon Peter. Now, obviously, you have breakfast, you have a fire. Just a few weeks earlier, it was around a fire that Peter was warming himself on a cold night. And it was during that time that he denied the Lord three times. I can't help but think as this is going on, Peter's there with the fire, with the food cooking and so forth. They're having breakfast that here's Jesus and Peter's thinking back to the last time he was around a fire and Jesus was there. He denied him three times. Jesus obviously knows this and that's why we have this situation here. Simon, son of jo Jonah, do you love me more than thee? Now, there's been a lot of talk about what the word these refers to. There's two popular answers to that question. First is that he's talking about fishing because they've been all night fishing. Peter was probably thinking, and I think there's some credibility to this. Peter said, I'm through. I, I've ruined any chance I have of being a disciple of Jesus, so I'm going to go back and do what I was doing before I follow Jesus. That's fishing. Even though Jesus has said, you're a fisherman, I'm going to teach you how to be a fisher of men. But Peter felt like that's all out the window. I'm through with that. I'm going back to fishing. And so maybe Jesus is challenging Peter here. Peter, are you willing to give away your career, your profession, fishing, and follow me. That's possible. Another possibility is that he's talking here about the other disciples. Because the other disciples are, are around there. They're in the area. And it was around the other disciples that Jesus, that Peter told Jesus, even if all these others desert you, I will never desert you. I'll never abandon you. So some believe that he's talking about the other disciples because so, they were around there. He said, and Jesus could have pointed out, said, Simon, do you love me more than these, these men? Because you, bro you boasted that you did. You bragged that you would serve me more than anyone else. So do you love me more than these? Of course, Peter says, yes, Lord, 
You know that I love you. Feed my lambs. You see, God is a forgiving God. God is a merciful God. Aren't you glad that God forgives? None of us are going to heaven unless we know the forgiveness of God. And Peter is a wonderful example, and I've used this so many times when I've had to deal with Christians down through the years who have fallen into sin of one kind or another. And they, they feel like they're ruined. They're embarrassed. They're ashamed. They feel like they're washed up, that God is through with them. They can't do anything again. And That's why I'm so glad this story of Peter is in the Bible. Here's a man who denied, not once, but three times that he even knew Jesus. And what made it worse was that he had bragged that this would never happen. Folks, always be careful what you promise and what you brag about. I've known people in my life who have stood up and said, I would never do anything like that. And they did. Because, you see, the devil knows the weakness of every single one of us. And if we start walking around with pride and conceit and arrogance and we're telling people, hey, I don't know about that person, why they did that, but I know I would never have done that. Be careful. Because you're giving the devil an opportunity to prove you wrong. Because he knows how to get to every single one of us if we let him. So be careful about what you brag about. Don't go around saying, oh, I would never do that. I know too many who have said that and then did it. Peter obviously is the classic example of that because of what he bragged, what he said, and then he ended up falling into the very thing that he said he would never do. So here we see in verse 16 a second time He's going to ask him again. We know what's going on here. Peter had denied the Lord three times. This was eaten at him. He couldn't get over it. Obviously, he would never forget this the rest of his life. So Jesus wants him to know, all right, three times I'm going to ask you this question. Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, well, yes, Lord, you know that I love you said to him, tend my sheep. See, you see what Jesus is saying here. Peter, I'm not through with you. You may think you're washed up. You may think you're through that God has no purpose for you because you blew it. Peter may have thought he had done the unpardonable sin, that there's no way he could be forgiven for this. Jesus was not about to give up on this man. He knew he could be restored. So he says, ten my sheep. Because you see, Peter is going to be the leader of the church in the first century. He, along with the apostle Paul, will be the two great movers in this first century. Peter will be known as the apostle to the Jews. Paul will be the apostle to the Gentiles. They write many books that are in our New Testament. In my sheep. Verse 17, he said to him the third time. Again, Peter is getting perturbed. Why do you keep asking me this same thing I've told you? He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? Peter doesn't really know what to say, so he finally just says, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Peter does love Jesus in his understanding of that, that word. He does still love Jesus. He just feels like he's lost all credibility with Jesus. He, he's of no purpose. He has no purpose, no usefulness anymore. So Jesus says to him again the third time, feed my sheep. 
which is obviously his way of saying, I'm not through with you, Peter. You're going to be a leader in the church when I'm gone. And he even tells him what the future is for him in verse 18. He says, most assuredly, in other words, this is definite. This is definitely going to happen. I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself, you walked where you wished, but when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. What a prophecy. A lot of people today question the Bible. You see it more than we've ever seen it in our lifetimes. Many people make fun of the Bible. They criticize the Bible. I always tell people, if you want to try to convince somebody that the Bible is the word of God, talk to them about the prophecies of Scripture and how they have fulfilled themselves over and over again. And here's another one. Peter, unbeknownst to him, of course, is going to live about 36, 37 more years after this event. We know that from church history. It's not recorded in the Bible, but we have a pretty good a record of Peter and how his life's going to end up and how his life's going to end. He's going to be executed under the Roman Emperor Nero's persecution of the church. But that's 30-some years down the road. Jesus here is telling Peter, when you're old, I qualify as old because Peter would have been about 66 Because Jesus himself said, Peter, when you're old, you're going to go where you don't want to go. And of course, the Bible says they were going to crucify, I mean, not the Bible, but the church history says that the story goes that when they were going to crucify Peter, he made a request. I am not worthy to die in the same manner as my Lord. Would you crucify me upside down? And the story says that's what they did. They hung him upside down and crucified him. Jesus says, they're going to take you where you don't wish he would die. Verse 19 the last verse we have in our text today says this, he spoke signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he has spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Peter is so happy because he knows his life is not in the tank. His life is not through. He's got a purpose. In fact, I'm sure this excited him there is restitution. There is a way I can make up for this. I denied the Lord three times, and I'm ashamed of that. I sinned grievously, but God is going to forgive me. And better than that, he's going to raise me up, and he's going to use me as a great leader of the Christian faith. And that's exactly what history points out. And Peter is, I believe, also glad because he's going to carry this with him the rest of his life. He knows he's going to live a full life, and he knows he's going to be martyred for the faith. That's fine with Peter, because he knows his life is going to have value. He is going to be useful in the master's work. Peter was asked three times, do you love me? What did Jesus say earlier in the Gospel of John? He said to his disciples, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. You will obey me. You will do whatever I ask you to do. This is what Peter is saying here. Lord, I'm willing to do anything. 
I'm willing to sacrifice anything because he has been forgiven. His life now is coming back together and he's excited. You know, we live in times today where we have to seriously ask ourselves, do we truly love Jesus? It's easy to say, oh yeah, I love Jesus. Always have. But the question is, do you obey Jesus? Because Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey me. That means you will do whatever I tell you to do, no matter what it may cost you. Even death. There's a reason, folks, why those early Christians turned the world upside down. It's very different from how Christians are today. They were so excited about serving Jesus and obeying Jesus that they were willing to suffer anything for the cause. And I always thought it was so ironic that when we're reading Scripture, so many of these authors of these books in the Bible were killed. They were put to death. They didn't live long, long lives of old, old age and then just die a peaceful death. Even like Peter, who lived to be an old man, even he was taken and violently, violently put to death. Paul was violently put to death, had his head cut off. Jesus, our own Lord and Savior, was violently put to death. We, in America, we've had a hard time even imagining anything like this. I grew up in a time, as many of you did, who are in my age bracket. We thought of America as a Christian nation. Uh, I remember growing up here in Davidson County, Sunday, you had blue laws. Nobody worked on Sunday. You went to church on Sunday. You couldn't do anything on Sunday morning. He had to wait till Sunday afternoon. Things, a few things would open up, but not much. And I just said, I grew up just assuming so much. But then things started to change. Uh, when I went to school as a little kid, we read the Bible in school. Can you imagine that? We did. I remember teachers who would have devotions in public school with us. Can you believe that? That there was a day and time when that actually happened. Young people have no concept of that, at least not in public schools. You would recite the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> so many things that today are looked down upon and done away with We've changed so much, and now in ways that we could never have imagined 60 years ago, now we as Christians are to die. We are. We are the number one enemy in the United States of America. Whether you like it or not, that is the case. And we have forces today that are determined to shut us down. I saw this coming back in the 1990s. And I would preach on this. And some people didn't like it. They said, Pastor, those things will never happen. Oh, you'll never come to that. I'm not a prophet, but I can say that almost everything that I warned people about in the 1990s has happened now and even worse.
we all are going to have to ask ourselves, do we really love Jesus? Because I believe as the days go by, it's going to cost us more and more. And that concerns me. I mean, how far are we willing to go in our devotion for Jesus when it starts costing us something? See, I didn't know that growing up. We just took that so much for granted as Christians. This was a Christian land, we, we, we thought, and, and that was the thing to do was to be a, a, a good church member and go to church and love Jesus, read our Bibles. That was just common. But now all of that is being sneered at, laughed at, ridiculed. You try to quote the Bible today in public and see what happens to you. They will be hooting you down, laughing at you, or even mad at you. They'll even say, how dare you use the Bible to prove your point? What Jesus said to Peter is something we all need to hear. Are you willing to sacrifice for me? there's anyone here today who cannot say for certain that they are a Christian, that you've been born again, I encourage you, I urge you today to make that decision, to give your heart and life to Jesus Christ and be a follower of his. Because, folks, it's worth it. You will reap eternal benefits when you make that decision, obviously you have no way of knowing what lies in front of you in the immediate future, in your time left on earth. But that's not supposed to be the factor anyway. The factor is we love Jesus. And because he's given us eternal life, he died on that cross, shed his blood, rose from the dead. He is the living Lord. We call upon his name, which is above all names. And that is the very heart of our message that is so ridiculed and lampooned today because we have the audacity to tell people there's only one way to God. How dare you say that? Because today we're taught diversity. All religions are good. All people, no matter what they believe in and follow in, are good. That's what we're told today. And we Christians, we're the party poopers. Because we say, oh, no, 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 Jesus is the only way. But Jesus tells us over and over again that we must follow him above all else. We don't just follow him when it's convenient. We don't just follow him because we get something out of it. It benefits us. No, we follow him because this is where he's leading us. This is his commandment. He tells us to go, we go. And we leave the outcome and the results up to him. We have to do his will. And this is what Peter does here. He's already been given the story of his life. He's going to serve the Lord for a generation to come. And then he's going to be violently taken and killed. But Peter's just so excited because his life is going to be useful to his Lord. And that's how we have to be. We have to have this mindset that following Jesus is worth it all, no matter what. Do you love Jesus? Only you can answer that question. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your, your word. Thank you for the scriptures that open up our hearts and tell us what we need to hear. Oh God, we live in such a dangerous time in the history of our country. And we know that things are happening that we could never have imagined years ago. But Lord, they are as they are and we have to face facts. And we have to realize now that our bragging about you and how we will serve you and love you no matter what might very well be challenged in the near future if it hasn't already been challenged. Because many people today are turning against you and your word and your precious son, Jesus. And we have to be prepared, Lord, for whatever may come. 
We have to be diligent in the fight. We have to realize, Lord, that we're in a war, a war for the truth of Jesus and who he is. And we have to stand up no matter how popular or unpopular that message is. We have to be willing to stand up for Jesus. And Lord, I just pray for everyone here today. You know our hearts. You know where we're at with you. Do we really love you? Are we willing to sacrifice for you? Are we willing to suffer for you? Lord, we don't know what the future holds, but you do. And we just have to hold your hand and let you lead us one step at a time. Take us, O Lord, and use us in these troubling times to be your servant, to show the world that we love you above all else. It's in that precious name, the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Rodney's going to come and lead us in the hymn of invitation. I'll be down here at the front. If I can be of any help to anyone here today who has a decision to make or you have questions on your heart about your personal relationship with Jesus, please deal with that. Let's, let's, let's get it out there. I'm here to help in any way I can. I love your pastor, Gary Myers, and I know you want him to get back, and he'll be back as soon as physically able, but I'm glad to fill in for him today and help in any way I can. Bless you, and may God bless this church. Thank you so much for the message. Mark's going to be at the back so you can express your thanks to him. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for the message. Father, help us to love you. Give us the strength and the power. Be with us now as we leave.